and welcome to Uranium Extraction, Transportation and Conversion into Energy with Kylie. In this program I hope to show you the processes of extracting uranium, transporting it to facilities and converting it into energy and the dangers and benefits of both of these. anywhere in vast quantities as it is spread out with large amounts in the oceans. Because of the high work to gain ratio, the majority of uranium mining is open cast mines. Originally miners would just mine the ore that was on the surface, but as mining techniques were refined they followed the seams of ore into the ground. Now we excavate the rock and soil or overburden above and follow the seam along. As they go, trucks take the soil from the overburden and deposit it behind to fill in the holes. Trucks pile up the overburden to replenish the hillside. The overburden is all the stuff that they don't need that has been excavated from the top of the ore seam. This type of mining makes it feasible to extract large quantities of uranium. It's also far safer, as with other types of mining, potentially fatal radon gas is released. However, these pits create eyesores, which are often either turned into landfills or left where they form lakes. Although they're practical, the damage that these things can do to the environment is a major source of concern for environmentalists and local people. Uranium was mined from 1947 to 1990 in Saxony, Germany. One of the former uranium producers was the mine at Coningston. I have here a resident of the local village whose tranquil and hilly setting was blighted by the scar on the landscape. I loved this wilderness. It was a jewel of the surrounding area, a lot like this area around here. There were wooded areas and flourishing land. I think it's a real shame that rich people can come along and destroy this beauty. I, of course, am not the only one with these feelings. And because of this, I am extremely disappointed. And now I have to live with similar views, like this. All of this, but just no more woodland. Simply open space and mess. It's not good. I hate it. All of this. It used to be a great place for treasure hunting. In the woods, all the fun, games and beauty. My children loved it. Now, a waste. The miners have ruined my life. Spartacus! This mine is of course no longer in use. And soon, Wismut GmbH will flood it and collect up the nucleic acid. This plans to collect an estimated two million pounds of tri-uranium octoxide from the mine water. Once the uranium has been extracted, it needs to be transported to facilities to refine it. It's usually transported on ships and in lorries. These trucks sometimes have to travel for many miles, often using up large quantities of energy. Inside these vehicles are large containers with thick lead-lined walls. These could survive being hit by a train at 125 miles per hour without so much as a scratch. The train crash was designed to be a spectacular demonstration that it is safe to transport nuclear fuel in steel flasks. It was described as the most horrendous and pessimistic crash that could be arranged. The train ran into the lid of the flask at nearly 100 miles an hour. As predicted, the lid stayed on. But today, Greenpeace said the crash was rigged. And they produced a document which they say was leaked to them from the nuclear industry and which they claim shows the crash was meant to cause only superficial damage to the flask. First, Greenpeace say the flask was positioned with a vulnerable valve away from the train to protect it. The CEGB say the flask was positioned so the train would exert maximum leverage on the lid. 
Greenpeace claimed the CEGB unbolted the heavy engine inside the locomotive so that during the crash it would sail over the flask instead of pushing into it. The CEGB say rubbish. The engine was not tampered with in any way. Greenpeace claim the carriages had weights in them to keep them on the ground and prevent them rising up and falling onto the flask because this could have damaged it. Again, rubbish, say the CGB. There were no weights in the carriages. Finally, the allegation is that the train was specially chosen because it would crumple more easily than other trains. Again, rubbish, say the CGB. The locomotive was the heaviest available. I find it quite laughable that anyone would consider we would put our reputation on the line in front of the, the engineers, the scientists, the cameras of the world. I mean, it's nonsensical. Isn't it just possible that perhaps some engineers might have pulled a few bolts or adjusted things to give you a favourable result? I think the only people who could conceivably have done that would be people who wanted to leave our employment rapidly or make a name for themselves in the comic strips. The CEGB are confident that the Greenpeace allegations won't be taken seriously. They say they have nothing to hide. Due to these containers, there's a relatively low incident rate with them. I have with me here the captain of a Polish uranium transporter, Tim Swelling. Tim, what goes on on your ship? Well, to transport the uranium, the first thing we have to do is load the uranium fuel rods into giant steel containers about 9 metres in diameter. Each container is a heavy duty box containing insulation material which forms an outer container. Fibreboard and plywood from the insulation material are shaped and sized to closely receive an inner container formed from stainless steel. The inner container has a closure lid that is bolted on and forms a seal through the use of O-rings. It's trade as a 30B cylinder and to a method and apparatus for using such an improved cylinder, enriched uranium hexafluoride has been shipped in conventional 30B cylinders for many years. So, how do you transport them around the world? Well, we use specially designed large vessels, yeah, which are as big as any oil or cargo vessel. The uranium containers are stored below decks in sealed holds which makes sure that no water can get in and cause the uranium to explode. After transportation, the uranium is refined and turned into rods which are used as fuel rods. These are then surrounded by boron to act as a control and neutrons are fired at them. When the neutron is fired at the atom, it splits open, spits out energy, radiation and other neutrons. This is Christopher Peacock, a former British worker at the Ukrainian plant of Chernobyl. Christopher, what happened? Well. I was working in Chernobyl as part of my uh, work as a nuclear reactor and um, waste disposal unit um, worker and the problem is there were, there's loads of safety procedures in the plant but many people were just ignoring them and this caused a huge meltdown in it because the rods got hot and it, in a nutshell the whole place just massive explosion and it was terrible really. Even many years after, Chernobyl still affects many families. Chris's own son is now ridiculously short. Will life ever be the same for Chris Peacock? We don't know. All these people featured on today's programme have had their lives affected by the processes of creating nuclear energy. Although there are many dangers to nuclear fuel, such as the meltdown at Chernobyl and other similar disasters, or even nuclear weapons, there is great benefit as well. Seeing as we are running out of uh, fossil fuels, these could bring great energy solutions. You've been watching Uranium Extraction, Transportation and Conversion into Energy with Kylie. Thank you and good night. Although they're practical, the damage is these difficult. Because of the high work to no, because of the high work to gain ratio, most of the no, Because of the high gain to rate no, because of the high because of the high work to gain ratio, most uranium mining is only with us. Oh! <laughs> Hello! <laughs> You're welcome to uranium extraction transportation and conversion. No, no! You pillars! The majority of uranium mining. <laughs> Two million pounds.